Okay, uh, so uh, in case you know, one of you are can't hear, you'll have to tell us. Okay, we are, today we are going to look at the subject of baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and uh, okay, first we will read uh, from Acts chapter 4, uh, 2 verse 4. You can open it in your Bibles. It is there on your screen. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, So, we are going to look at this very important subject today. Okay, uh, In a sense, uh, Christianity is divided. There are a lot of believers, even good uh, practicing believers who are on both sides of the spectrum. But we will look at what the Bible tells us. We will look at it uh, from the perspective of the book of Acts and whatever is written in the Bible. Okay. Uh, there are some questions which come to our mind uh, when we think of this subject. Uh, we would like to know what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible tell us about tongues. Is it a sign of the baptism of the Spirit? Just a minute. Huh? What does the Bible tell us about speaking in tongues? Is it a sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is this experience different from the salvation experience? What is the difference between baptism of the Holy Spirit and filling of the Holy Spirit? Is speaking in tongues observed in the church today? Okay, And is it a gift which gives us a closer connect with God and empowers us for a powerful ministry? Okay. Because these are some things which are uh, claimed by different people. So we need to look at it. And we will be looking at these uh, topics uh, from the Bible. How the Bible addresses these questions we will be looking at. Okay. Uh, before we look at uh, this, we will understand two words which are used. We will be looking at a secular dictionary actually. Uh, so that we will understand the words as it was understood, is understood by different people. Uh, when Christians look at it, there is a different connotation associated with it. So we will look at this word. There is a word called glossolalia. Okay. It is derived from two words, glossa, which means tongue or language, and lalia, which means chatter or speak. Uh, that is where we get the word speaking in tongues. Okay. So wherever this word speaking in tongues is mentioned, uh, in the Bible, this word glossal area will be also associated with it. Okay, uh, simply glossa would mean tongue or language, and lalia means speak or chatter. Okay, it is a phenomenon that occurs when a person experiencing religious ecstasy or trance. Okay, this is how the secular dictionary is defined: it. utter incomprehensible sounds that they believe are a language spoken through them by a god or deity okay so if it is a feeling that people have that uh, the incomprehensible or words that cannot be understood are uh, uttered and they have belong to a language that is spoken uh, somewhere and uh, through them a god or deity is speaking through them okay uh, the definition is very broad in uh, this thing you will come to understand why the secular dictionaries 
uh, define it this way. Okay, but it still gives you an understanding of what it is. It is believed that a person speaking in tongues is temporarily being gifted the ability to speak a language they don't know. Okay, this is how the secular dictionary is understanding. There is another word for xenoglossia. Okay, this is not there in the Bible. Xeno means alien, strange. Glossa means language or tongue. Okay, uh, it, it has to do uh, with the ability to speak in a language that one has never heard before. It's similar to glossa lelia. Okay, and may have been acquired through a paranormal means. For example, during a trance to communicate with spirits. Okay. So the secular world distinguishes glossolalia and xenoglossia. Glossolalia to indicate like, you know, something where uh, God is involved and xenoglossia where something, the spirit world or the demonic world or evil spirits are involved. Okay, this is how they look at it. In general, xenoglossia doesn't have the religious implications that glossolalia does, you know. That people who practice xenoglossia, they don't tell that, you know, God is behind their speech, their ability to speak in an unknown language or with strange words, okay? But we need to be careful, okay? Because today's study is to make us aware of what uh, uh, is speaking in tongues and what we need to understand, okay? It is a common practice in pagan religions and often as well. Okay, while we hear a lot about it within the Christian churches and communities, we must recognize that it is not unique to Christianity. It is practiced in other religions, other cults as well. Okay, and that therein lies the danger, and we need to be careful of that. Ecstatic speech uh, is common in many religions of the world, including Sufi Islam, Voodoo practitioners of Haiti, Tibetan monks, several. Uh, practice as cults in India as well, no religious cults in India and in many other uh, places across the globe. It is a global phenomenon. Okay, Joseph Smith, who started Mormonism, Mormonism is a cult. Uh, it is called also the Church of the Latter Day Saints. It's a Christian cult because it's uh, so called says that it originates from the Bible. In the, it started in the 1800s. They believed and practiced speaking in tongues as well. Okay. Alan Kardec, I'm just giving one example from each category so that you understand how widespread speaking in tongues is. Okay. Alan Kardec, the founder of spiritism, that is, they communicate with spirits uh, and practice of mediumship, etc., stated that glossolalia is evidence of a spirit's presence in the room. Okay, so when spirit is gathered, they light candles, they, uh, they draw a pentagram, they stand around it and worship. There are uh, uh, similar observations, you know, when people start speaking in tongues. And uh, this, the founder of this movement and the one who wrote many books that has become a foundation for many spiritists to practice uh, as a medium, uh, they say that it is evidence of uh, a spirit's presence in the room. Okay? As far as the church is concerned, okay, uh, the speaking in tongues was not a very common phenomenon through the centuries. Okay? Uh, in many generations, there were sporadic groups where speaking in tongues was observed and practiced, but it was not a very common phenomenon till the first wave. There are three waves called of the uh, movement of the spirit. Okay, the first wave started in the early 20th century. Okay, that is 1900 onwards. Okay, it is called the Pentecostal movement. Okay, that is when they started giving emphasis to speaking in tongues as a second experience and a whole doctrine of uh, tongues and baptism of the spirit was built around it. Okay, this is called as the first wave. Somewhere in the 1950s, a uh, second wave started, okay, when uh, this Pentecostalism became very popular in the world, okay. It is when mainline churches started getting influenced by the phenomena, that is uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the CNI, the CSI, and uh, many other denominations also started 
getting influenced. This is called as the second wave. It is also called as the charismatic movement. Then came the third wave in 1980 plus. Okay. It is an unstructured movement with no fixed doctrine. Okay. There are a lot of practices which came up, which are called as holy laughter, sin vomiting, animal behavior. You know, people crawl in the roof. They growl like dogs. And uh, they uh, twist and turn on the floor like serpents when they say that the Spirit of God has come upon them. Okay. This is the third wave movement. There is Benny Hinn. Uh, and a lot of people are uh, fallen on the floor. Uh, the phenomena is called as slaying in the spirit, uh, which is practiced by many, many uh, similar practitioners. Uh, it is called as the third wave uh, of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I am using that terminology. I am not saying it is the third wave, but that is how it is called. A modern experience, just an example for us to be aware that, you know, in groups where people are very eagerly seeking to uh, experience uh, 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 this speaking in tongues and uh, having a different kind of encounter what they go through, okay? April 20, 2016, not far back, okay, about seven, eight years back in Somerset, a city in Kentucky in United States. Okay, uh, people started within that congregation. The afternoon worship was going on in the church of the prophetic word and cries of hallelujah and fire, more fire rang out from the congregation. Okay, the reason the crowd was responding because one individual in the congregation was uttering words that they did not understand. Okay, they were having a worship time and during the worship somebody started speaking and uttering words which they did not understand. The excitement turned to disappointment Shortly, when the worship leader who was leading the highly charged worship session recognized that person as a Hungarian exchange student staying in the home of one of their church members. Okay, and this this boy, 18 year old, originally from Hungary, was actually speaking in his. He was reading the Bible in his mother tongue because he was not very familiar with English. So uh, when others were praising and worshiping, he started reading, and people mistook it for that. Okay, just a few weeks earlier, uh, this church has a big presence in the internet anyway. Okay, and uh, they thought that uh, during the meeting, smoke started filling their hall and they thought a glory cloud had filled the room and suddenly they discovered that the HVAC system, that is the air conditioning system, a uh, short circuit had taken place and they were actually uh, in a serious trouble actually okay so expectations of an experience beyond the biblical uh fueled the disappointment in that afternoon within this group okay so i just gave it as an example so that we know that you know if we have wrong expectations then we see something happening as well okay what does the bible speak about the baptism of the holy spirit we will take a look at some of the bible verses that mention Baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are only uh, five, six verses that talk about uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. We look at each one of them. Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. Can someone read it? Ria, can you read it loudly? I baptize him with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize him with the Holy Spirit and power. His renewing hope is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the bar, and burning up the shaft with unquenched fire. Okay, so this is the first reference. Which, uh, when, uh, who uttered it? John the Baptist. When did he say this? Loudly. Before the baptism of our Lord. Okay. When it talks about baptism of the Holy Spirit, is it a present tense, past tense, or future tense? Which tense it is? Will baptize means future. Okay. So all the verses that we are going to read, you will also note the tense. Okay. Do know you can read Mark 1, 7 to 8. And this was his message. After me comes the one more, more powerful than I, 
the straps of the sandals are not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Who is it talking about? Jesus Christ. Who is talking? John the Baptist. Same incident. Okay, before the baptism of our Lord. What tense it is? Future tense. Okay. We are going to look at all the six references. There are only six references. Okay. Luke 3, 16 to 17. Why not? But one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of two sandals are not worthy to untie. He will baptize him with the Holy Spirit and power. His winnowing hook is in his hand. He has a fishing sword, and he gathers the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with his feet. So, again, it is the same uh, event that is being spoken of. John the Baptist talking about our Lord before the baptism of our Lord and he is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit as a future event. Okay. John 1 33. Who will read it? Jinsen. I myself did not know him but the one who sent me to baptize with water to me. The man on him you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Okay, again, it's John talking. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is future tense. Okay, how many verses do you see? Four. All four Gospels, the same event is there. Okay, now we look at Acts chapter 1, verse 4 to 5. Who will read it? Can you read loudly? Please. talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit. Which tense it is? Future tense. Okay. But near future. He says very soon in a few days you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Okay. And they were supposed to wait till that time. How many verses you have seen? Five verses. There is only one more verse. One Corinthians chapter twelve, verse thirteen. Okay, Rakesh, you can read it. क्योंकि हम सब ने क्या यहूदी हो क्या यह क्या यूनानी क्या दास क्या सत्संग रखी है कि आत्मा के द्वारा एक देह होने के लिए बक्तिस में लिया और हम सब को एक ही आत्मा बनाया गया. Okay, the answer came already. Who is telling? Paul. Okay, to the church at Corinth. Okay, which tense it is? Past tense. Okay, five verses for future tense and one is past tense. Okay, so what you can say from the baptism of the Holy Spirit was an event that took place after the resurrection of the Lord. But before the church was planted in Corinth. Okay? Well before that, the event took place. And when you read what is mentioned there, it is the day when the body of Christ, the church was born. Okay? For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Okay? That is the day when the, was the first day of the church. 
Okay. This topic, now keep this in mind. This topic, baptism of the Holy Spirit, is never spoken of by anyone else. Neither Paul, nor Peter, nor James, nor John, nor Jude. None of the writers of the New Testament write about this subject subsequent to this. Okay? The, they don't use the word baptism of the Holy Spirit. What does the word baptizo mean? What is the meaning? Immerse. Hit, immerse. Submerge. Okay? That is the word. Okay? So this event was future tense when the Lord was on the earth. After ascension, before the church at Corinth was uh, uh, addressed, it was already past tense. Okay? The event is described in Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. Okay, can Joanna read it? All four verses. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, they separated and came the rest of each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, so what are the things that we notice in this? There was a sound, okay, like a violent wind. It filled the whole room in which they were seated. Then what happened? Tongues of fire, which separated and rested on each one of them, okay. Third, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Fourth, they began to speak in other tongues as the spirit enables them. Okay. We will be coming to this verse for later on, a little later, you know, when we will look at the original Greek words to understand what the Bible is telling us. Okay. It is a unique event in history. Okay, this is what it happened only once. The phenomena has never been repeated. Sound of a violent wind, tongues of fire resting on individuals, speaking in tongues. You know, these are never repeated. Filling of the Holy Spirit is repeated. We will come to that as well again. Okay. These three never get repeated again together in an event. Okay. There is no command in the Bible to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay. This also. Nowhere in the New Testament. I told there are so few references and there is also no command to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. There is a command to be filled by the Holy Spirit. There is no command to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Okay. When you look at it, the way it presents itself, it is meant to be an event which unified all Christians. It is the event through which all Christians who are given birth together into the family of God. Okay. It placed us together with no distinction of high or low. No Jew nor Gentile. That is how it puts. No slave or no free person. Okay. All barriers, all distinctions were removed and we were placed together into one body. Okay. It is supposed to be an unifying event. Sad to say, it has become a divisive event. You know, where so many people are fighting against one another because of the lot of misunderstandings we have on the subject. Okay. I said filling of the spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a repeated event. Okay. But filling of the Spirit, Holy Spirit is a repeated or event. Believers are commanded to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Okay. Don't be filled with wine. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Nowhere command is there for getting baptized by the Holy Spirit, but there is a command to be filled by the Holy Spirit. The grammatical construction of this passage indicates Believers are to be continuously, that being filled experience is supposed to be a continuous experience with the Holy Spirit. How will you fill uh, yourself with the Holy Spirit? There's a lot of yourself to be emptied of. You know, the fill, the dirt, and the things that don't belong to God which are there within us, we're moving out. Okay? And uh, the Spirit of God is able to move in through that. Although filled initially on the day of Pentecost, Peter was filled again in Acts chapter 4, verse 8. You will find that. You can read it if you want or you can just... Can someone read it loudly? Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. 
immediately, quickly, all references we will not look at. Then Peter went to the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and then the Okay, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. He was already filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now when he is talking to the uh, people who uh, were opposing him, he is also filled and it helped him to speak. Many of the same people filled with the Spirit in Acts chapter 2 were filled again in Acts chapter 4 verse 31 as well. Okay. Acts 6 5 describes Stephen as a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Yet in Acts 7 55, we are told that he is filled again by the Holy Spirit. Okay. This is just prior to his martyrdom. Paul was filled with the Spirit in Acts 9 17 and again in Acts 13. Verse 9. Okay. So we will notice that in the book of Acts, which records the history of the early church, baptism is not a repeated event, but filling of the Holy Spirit is certainly a repeated event. And in none of these events where people were filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. Okay. What was observed? Okay, the phenomena that was observed at Pentecost that we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 4 to 13. You know, there's a passage which deals with that. Okay, you can open it in your Bible. There are two words uh, which are used to describe this experience of tongues. Okay. Uh, English is different, but Greek is different. So, there are two different words that are used. Alos, which means same kind. Okay. Heteros means another kind. Okay. When we look at this uh, room, we are of the heteros kind as far as languages are concerned. No? I speak Tamil, others speak Hindi, others speak Malayalam. Okay. So we are heteros. But when we look at, say, my family only, we are alos in the language that we are speaking. Okay. So, the word alos and heteros are used in uh, these passages and we need to understand. The gathered believers started speaking in heteros languages. Heteros means different languages. So, the speaker was speaking in a different language than what we were familiar with. Heteros, that Greek word is used, okay, other than their own languages, okay, with this spoke. The hearers heard their message. The verses are mentioned. So if you are noting down, you can write it down. The hearers heard the message in their own dialecto. Okay. Now, a very different word is used. It's not language that is used. It is dialecto. You understand what is the difference between a dialect and a language? Huh? There are variations in language. There's many types of Tamils, many types of Gujarati, Navran Tavar's uh, watchman, you know, we had a watchman, not, not now, uh, he is not there, he said, I could never understand this Gujarati. Okay, he spoke in a dialect which I could not understand. What they spoke was in a dialect that was local to a region. Okay. They list over, they turn up, we are Medes, we are Parthians, we are uh, Cyprians, so many, more than 12 local dialects, you know. The hearers had come from certain region in those places, certain region, okay. And the local dialect of that region, they could hear, okay. When you study the Greek words, whenever you study the Bible, you will enjoy it, okay. There are uh, uh, softwares like eSword, which you can download, which is free, okay, and uh, it will give you uh, interlinear uh, Bibles, okay, where the Greek and English are parallel side by side, and you click on those words, you will understand the meaning, you will understand where else the same word is used, you can read that verse and you can have a better understanding of it, okay, it, it makes study of God's word more Interesting and thrilling. Okay. We can conclude that they were speaking in languages unknown to themselves, but known to the hearers. 
and very specifically in the local dialect. Okay, this was not ecstatic gibberish or meaningless sounds. Okay, but they were specific languages, specific traits that was spoken in a region in the world, and whose hearers were present. Okay. Had they not been there, had it been some other, it was, it was not like, you know, local dialect of India. There were no Indians mentioned there. Okay. So, Hindi was not spoken there. You understand? It was a dialect, local dialect of the people who were present on the day of Pentecost. Some thought they were drunk because they were speaking what appeared to be strange because all the hearers could not understand what was being spoken. Okay. But Peter argued, it's just 9 o'clock in the morning. That was his argument, good sound argument. Then he said it is fulfillment of Joel 2, 28 to 32. Okay? Where God promised to pour out his spirit. Okay? And people would see visions, they will dream dreams, and uh, they would prophesy, and they will speak in tongues. The spirit of God will to all that. Okay. The amazement led to their rapt attention with which they listened to Peter's message that followed this talk. Okay. This phenomena that took place. Just after that, Peter preached to the crowd. Okay. And uh, 3,000 people were added to the church on that day. The crowd was Jewish. You get it? Want you to keep note of this also. Because in verse 2, verse chapter 2, verse 11, it specifically mentions that, mentions that they were Jews or converts to Judaism. So it is predominantly people who are now Jews. Even had they been Gentiles, they were now Jews because they had circumcised and they had adopted the Jewish religion. Okay. Did they speak in tongues? This crowd of 3,000. Okay, so read the Bible very carefully when you read it. This is following the church was born at that time. When the disciples and whoever else was with them, that was group which was together, was fused together to form the body of Christ. Subsequent additions to this body did not have the same phenomena that was observed at that time. Okay. No tongues of fire, no gushing of winds, okay, because the message was long. Okay, it took place after some time. No further speaking in tongues is mentioned. Peter's fiery message delivered to curious onlookers result in unspoken tongues. Sorry, it's a repeat. Church continues to meet every day in different forms. When you read Acts chapter 3, 4, you will come to that. Signs and wonders continue. Daily additions to numbers take place, okay, as given in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. But there is no mention of people speaking in tongues after they believe and are baptized, okay. Peter was jailed after he addressed an awestruck audience. Who witnessed the healing of a lame man? Acts chapter 4, verse 4. Many in the crowd they believed, hearing the message of Peter. Numbers swelled and became 5,000 by then. Okay? No mention of tongues. The crowds are still Jewish. Keep this in mind because we are going to see tongues again later on. Then Samaria received the Good news. Which chapter Samaria comes? Huh? Okay. Chapter 8. Okay. After persecution of Peter by Stephen and all, no? the church gets, begins to get scattered. Church penetrated the region of Samaria. What is What do you know about Samaria? Samaria is the place where Jews and Gentiles you know, there was a mixed community, Jews who married Gentiles, Gentiles who married Jews, and uh, uh, people were born, they were called Samaritans. They lived in that area, large numbers of them. 
Philip the evangelist makes a breakthrough and many believe, including Simon the sorcerer who was named the great power of God. Okay, you read that in uh, Acts chapter 8. Signs and wonders abound even in Samaria. God attests the work done by Philip the evangelist. People believe and are baptized. Many of them believe, but they do not receive the Within the Jews, they receive the Holy Spirit. Outside the Jewish community, they don't receive the Holy Spirit. It is mentioned. Okay? The apostles Peter and John were sent to Samaria okay, to meet the believers in Samaria. As they placed their hands on the believers, they received the Holy Spirit. No mention is made of them. Okay? The Samaritans got incorporated in the church. Okay, but there was a delay. It didn't happen through Philip the evangelist preaching. You know, people believed they were added, but they were added to the body of Christ after after Peter went and laid hands on them and prayed. Okay, remember our Lord had mentioned the keys. You know, people misinterpret that verse. You know, uh, it is connected to his unlocking the church in different communities. It is Peter who will go to the house of Cornelius as well, a Gentile. No mention of tongues is there. Another category of believers were incorporated into the church, the Samaritans. Okay. The Lord said. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Behold, I am with you always. And the spread was mentioned as taking place from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the year. Okay. So, we are now past Jerusalem, Judea, and into Samaria. Then we hear about Cornelius hearing the good news. You should note the timeline. Ten years are gone. You know, when you read the Bible just casually, you might get the feeling that, you know, Abhishek, pat, 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 everything is happening. It's not. Okay, ten years are past. We know those events that take place. You know, Cornelius praying, God telling him to send people to call fetch Peter who is living in another Simon's house, Simon the Tanner, God preparing Simon by giving him a blanket full of things that he is not allowed to eat. Okay, and God tells him, you eat, and God makes him eat it, and God makes him ready for it. Okay, he comes here. But when Peter comes to the home of Cornelius, he goes inside. What he feels? Discomfort. Because he is entering into the home of a Gentile. He is not supposed to go because he will become impure when he goes to the home of a Gentile. And he expresses it. Nice guess. No? Suppose you all came and said, actually, you know, Peter started his speech like that. I tell you, actually, I should be here in the first place. Nice way to start preaching the gospel. Okay, but that's how he started. Then he talked and talked and talked and talked, but God was getting impatient. Bible says, while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Acts chapter 10, verse 42. Okay. God didn't wait for Peter to give his concluding talk. Okay. The Jewish teammates who were with him in verse 45, they were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the inside. Okay. They heard them speaking in tongues. Okay. Till now, believers were getting added. They never spoke in tongues. Samaritans were added. Peter prayed and they got incorporated into the church. They were half Jewish. Okay. But now when it comes to a Gentile believer, okay, they speak in tongues. Peter, seeing all this, he says, there is nothing to prevent them from being baptized with water because they have received the Holy Spirit just as 
we have. Okay. So he is connecting it to an event 10 years ago. They had an experience of the Spirit of God. Okay. And he is telling that 10 years later now, a second event has taken place. Okay. The Gentiles were a distinct group of people in the eyes of God. Okay, that is why when Paul writes also, he says, we were incorporated into the body, Jews and Gentiles. Okay, mentioned separately. Okay, this unique second event was likened by Peter as an event that was same as what the first group of Jewish believers had experienced. You know, the term that he uses just as we have. Criticism arose from the circumcised believers when Peter visited Jerusalem. Okay. They started questioning him. How can you go to a Gentile's home? Peter himself had felt that discomfort. Now he has to defend what he had done because he baptized them as well. Okay. Peter repeats his observation of how the Holy Spirit came on them just as he had at Pentecost. Okay. And justified his actions by concluding that he couldn't stand in the way of God. Okay. After Peter made this lavish big speech, all objections ended. Okay. The believers who till that time were thinking that Peter had done wrong, agreed that this was the right thing to be done. And they praised God for granting his grace to the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles also now have received repentance that leads to eternal life. Okay, they understood that the Gentile community was also added into the church. The Jews celebrated seven feasts. We have seen that before. Can someone tell quickly in the sequence in which it is there? You know, try to remember those things. Those will help you to study the Bible. First one was Passover. Second, unleavened bread. Okay, Passover stood for the death of the Lord. It was Passover day in which our Lord was crucified. Okay, our new birth begins with that experience. You know, of a, we break bread also because of that only. Okay, broken body, shed blood. Okay. Then the third was festival was feast of first fruit. It was to be on the first Sunday for the day following the Sabbath after the Passover. So that is why it was the Sunday. And that was precisely the day on which our Lord was resurrected. You get it? God's timetable was fixed into Jewish minds and memories. Okay. Next festival that they were having was the Feast of Pentecost. They were told count 50 days. Pentecost means 50. Okay. So God simply gave them practices by which they could make out. Okay. So 50 days from the day after the Sabbath following the Passover. That means 50 days counting from the Feast of First fruit. 50 days means how many weeks? 7 weeks will be 49. Okay. Followed by one day. So 7 Sabbaths and one day. That is a Sunday. First fruits will be on a Sunday. Resurrection was on a Sunday. Feast of Pentecost when it will be? On a Sunday. Okay. Because 50 days later will be a Sunday only. So, there was a feast, there was a holiday, there were people gathered and God was preparing them for something that was going to take place. They had a unique practice that they had to follow. Okay? On the feast of which feast? Pentecost. In all the feasts, they were asked to use bread that was without leaven. This is the only feast where bread with leaven had to be used. Not one bread, but they had to bake two. And both the breads had to be waved before God and it would be accepted. Okay? The imagery that was built for these two communities, the Jews and Gentiles, leaven standing for sin, 
we are being accepted as we are because of what our Lord did on the Passover day, His resurrection on the day of first fruits. Okay, and we being accepted together as the church of Christ. Okay, that is the imagery that was there. So when people had come with this anticipation, they had to see that imagery. Okay. The Bible on tongues. There are seven things we will quickly go to. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to 14. They give us these pictures of what the Bible teaches about talking in tongues, speaking in tongues. So baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have seen. There is, it is a non-repeating thing. But whether speaking in tongues is current and other things, we will see. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to 14, Paul does write about tongues. Okay, so we must understand that Paul did write about tongues. Okay, there are seven things he speaks about. The first is a warning from their past. He wants the Jewish believe, the believers in Corinth. They were Gentile believers. Corinthians had a reason to be careful. They had just gotten themselves out of trouble from idolatry. Okay, Paul is telling you are already immersed in idolatry and you have just come out of it. Okay, then he gives a test in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Those who are speaking in tongues with the Holy Spirit will not say Jesus be cursed. They will be saying Jesus is Lord. He gives a test. Okay, when you hear tongues, they will not be blaspheming God in any way. Okay. They come from a background of paganism. We have seen in the past, no? Pagan religions had speaking in tongues. Okay. So Paul is telling, if the speaking in tongues has an element of occult, be very careful. Okay. And he said that, you know, no one who is filled with the Spirit of God will say, Jesus be first. Had a friend in Mumbai, okay, who had gone to a charismatic church in UK. Okay. When he went to that church, uh, they were speaking in tongues during their prayer time. Okay. The guy, the white gentleman next to him, an old man, started speaking in Hindi. So he was interested suddenly, you know, because he could understand it also what he is speaking. And he was blaspheming. Okay. That man had no idea that he was actually blaspheming. But that's what he was doing. But because this boy understood Hindi, he could understand. But that man who was speaking had no idea what he was speaking. Paul's first warning is, be careful. Okay? They shouldn't get entangled with something that had dangerous potential for imitation and deceit if proper checks were not in place. Okay? The Corinthians were speaking in tongues. Okay? So, we must not feel that, you know, that all the tongues that they, that, uh, that was practiced was not tongues. But they were speaking in unknown languages. But Paul says, be careful. Because the source can be from the other side. He said, it is not a gift that you should seek. That is the second thing that Paul is telling in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 11, he says that the Holy Spirit has given his gift to each person as he determines. If a person asks, it is no longer a gift. A gift cannot be demanded. You cannot demand a gift for your wedding or your birthday or for anything for that matter. Sometimes children do ask and we do give, but gifts are not demanded. God is building a body with many parts. This is what Paul wants us to understand. Just as he wants it to be. Okay, He is the architect. He is building it. So he is adding the parts as he deems fit. Hand where a hand should be, leg where a leg should be, eye where an eye should be. Okay, that is what 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about. Many gifts, many combinations of them, many manifestations, those who have uh, administrative skills also will have different kinds of manifestations, but we can't decide what we want to have. Okay, God will decide, God will give, what variation of the gift has to be given, He will decide. This is what Paul says. All our necessary gifts, 
you know they were saying i can't say to the hand i don't need you or to the eye i don't need you i can't say to the hand or leg you know every gift is needed and nobody can chase it out all won't speak in tongues you know there are many who teach us that you know people should speak in tongues every christian should speak in tongues it's not there paul himself said that in acts uh, in 1 corinthians 12 verse 30 we must let god be god in dealing with who should have what gift i think that is the second thing that paul wanted us to know third thing great gifts but no use if there is no okay everyone wanted the public gifts no prophesying speaking in tongues exercising our tremendous faith you know and all those things so paul was saying that you know those are of no use if there is no love in that person. The internal characteristics of the person is what you need to seek for. He, that is what Paul is saying. First, after saying that God will decide what to give, he is saying what you need to seek is a good spiritual life, pure spiritual life, eradicating and remove wrongs from our life. You know, Not seeking after gifts. Okay, That God will decide, God will give. Faith, hope and love will remain even after prophecies cease, tongues are still and knowledge passes away. Okay. That means these three gifts will at some point of time end. But love will remain even after all these things are things of the past. Okay. Paul compares this with a growing of process. Okay, he tells that a child becomes a man. Many things that you did as a child, you don't do when you grow up as a man. Okay, you talk differently, you think differently, you reason differently. You know, a child reasons differently, you reason differently. Okay, in the same way, as you grow up, what you need to do, you must not be giftish in your life, but rather. Spiritual, wanting to have those attributes in your life which count for eternity. Okay. As far as those three things, you know, faith, prophecy, and tongues. About prophecy, it says it will disappear when perfection or completion comes. Okay, there is a specific mention. And when we can see face to face instead of seeing in a mirror. When you see in a mirror, bathroom mein kabhi dekha rega, no? when this form, after you have a hot bath, whatever dikta nahi. Okay? When you see face to face, it is not different. Tongues seem to have disappeared already when the apostles were being called home. By the time the disciples were going home, it seems to have already reduced to such an extent or even disappeared. God didn't give a time frame for its disappearance as he had given for prophecy. The gift usage and control of practice of tongues is given only in the first book of Corinthians, which was written when? AD 53, approximately AD 53. Subsequently, there are other passages which talk about spiritual gifts. Romans and Ephesians, they were written later on, 57 AD and 62 AD. There is no mention of speaking in tongues. Okay. It appears as if this gift of tongues or what was being exercised in the church at Corinth also had started fading away or disappearing. Okay. This indicates the gift was not observed in the churches to warrant writing about it. It was not such a serious topic that the authors wanted to write about it. The fourth thing that Paul is saying is that we must seek gifts, okay, seek things which will build or edify others constructively. Okay, then he draws a big difference between prophesying and talking in tongues. Okay, especially in public meetings. He talks about that. Two aspects he talks about. Understanding and building up.
Fourth, when a person is teaching from the word of God, also is prophesying. Future faith telling is a small part of prophecy. Much of it is speaking forth on behalf of God, speaking, preaching from God's word. Okay. And building up happens when God's word is taught, spoken of, taught in a way that is understood by people. Okay. But just speaking in tongues, which is not understood by others, does not build up. Okay. So both those categories are a flaw. So that's what Paul wants them to understand. Even lifeless things are useful only when they make something meaningful. He uses two examples. A harp, you know, with only if you make distinct sounds with a harp or a guitar, you know, it will be music. If you just bang it away, it has no music. A trumpet gives a clear call. Unless it gives a clear call, who will get ready for battle? You know, the call to worship or call to battle or whatever it may be in our olden villages and even now in back in our native places, the church bells ring. Different ways to call people on Sunday for meetings. Different ways when people have died. Different ways when weddings are there or different events take place. People who hear the sound of the bell, they know what has happened. Okay, so clear call, inanimate things also have to make, then only it will be useful. So this example also Paul says when he's talking about tongues and about preaching. Okay, one makes sounds which are not distinct and giving clear call, the other is understood. How can people understand or grasp meaning, he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 9 to 11, if the speaker is giving out words that don't make any sense? either to himself or to his hearers. Okay. See gifts that build up the church, not which are not productive. Okay. Paul is very clear in all his arguments because chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14 are all passages that are speak, uh, talking about tongues which was in practice in the church at Corinth at that time. Okay. Can we pray in tongues in public? Okay. That is the next thing that Paul wants to talk about. Paul says, when a person prays in tongues, his spirit prays, but his mind is unfruitful. Even he doesn't understand. Okay, it's not beneficial to him. I'll show you some medical things also after that. Similarly, he says about singing and worship. Okay, Things that come from just like that, you know, are having no impact. Neither can the person understand it, nor can the others benefit from it. Okay. No one will be able to say Amen at the end of it. That's what Paul is saying. That means Amen means I agree with you. Nobody will be able to say because they have not understood what prayer is being uttered, what uh, song is being sung, what worship is being initiated. They won't know. No one is built up according to Paul in verse 17. Okay. Paul spoke. Paul says, I speak more in tongues than anyone else. Okay. But, I'm sorry, it's not not, but it is but, prefer to speak five words which can be understood than 10,000 words which can't be understood by anyone. See the logic that Paul is building up. When he is teaching about how they should use the gift of tongues within their glossolalia and science. Okay, There is a psychiatry research magazine Neuroimaging, in which November 2006, this article came up. Psychiatrists were probing what happens inside the human brain when people speak in tongues. Psychiatrist Andrew Newberg is not a believer, okay, of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, conducted experiments on five volunteers, okay. Radioactive tracers were used to identify which parts of the brain are active, okay, when a person goes through that phenomena where he speaks in tongues and uh, has ecstatic behavior, uh, what exactly is happening, okay? And they used this uh, machine, you know, photon emission computed tomography machine, okay, to map the brain, to understand which area of the brain becomes active. That is basically the equipment which is used to understand when you are talking, some areas of your brain light up, okay? When you are what uh, happy some areas like that. 
you know, different areas of the brain. When you start thinking, or recalling things from the past, other areas light up. Okay. So they give radioactive isotopes that map uh, people. Okay. The uh, frontal lobe activity was low. Okay. Frontal lobe is this part. Okay. Was low. And the parietal activity was much higher. Okay. This was an observation. What does the frontal lobe do? It has to do with conscious decisions and actions that we take. Okay. When you give me a choice, you know, which song to sing, my frontal lobe will be active, it will light up if I'm inside that equipment. Okay. Parietal lobe is catching things in the background. Okay. You know, you're not thinking consciously, but it makes you aware. Suddenly, Rakesh by my sensory organ organs will alert me that something is happening. For example, things that are happening in the surrounding areas that I am aware of. Okay. So here parietal activity was higher and the frontal activity was lower. Okay, what does it indicate? That person is losing control of his own thought process. Okay, where he is able to decide and is more dependent on what is happening in the surrounding areas. Okay, that is why when people start falling, like uh, that swaying in the spirit experience, where people fall down on the scale, many others start falling. Okay, because the parietal area is very active, whereas the frontal area which controls. The person who starts wielding it control of, he starts experiencing it. Okay. Exactly what Paul was saying when he said, our mind is unfruitful. You know, your mind has left its conscious control over those things. Consciously worshipping God. Consciously praying uh, to God. Consciously uh, singing uh, to God's glory. Okay. The results were exactly opposite of what happened during meditation. These are other forms of meditation. In meditation, a person uh, forcibly concentrates on something and loses control of other things. Okay, So, his parietal activity goes low and his frontal activity goes high. Okay. Terms are a sign for unbelievers, not for believers, according to God. Okay. Isaiah 28, 11 to 12, with other tongues and the lips of foreigners, I will speak to those people but even then they will not listen to me. Okay. On the day of Pentecost, with languages of Gentiles, God spoke. The crowd that was gathered was Jewish. We have seen that before. Or Jewish converts. Okay. God was speaking to them. 3,000 got added, but all those who could have been added were not added. Even to this day, they are existing. The turning to God. Okay. Unbelievers will be benefited, Paul says, if they hear prophecy. They will be convicted of sin, their hearts will be laid bare, and they will respond by saying, God is really among you. Okay, because they are able to understand what is being preached to them with understanding. If they hear everyone speaking in tongues, they will think, you are out of your mind. Okay, that's what the Corinthians had a tendency to use this gift more than anything else. And so Paul was telling that, you know, unwise use of the gift, especially when non-Christians are there, around, okay, it will be counterproductive, not productive. Okay? Order in meetings. I think there are eight points. When you come together, this is what Paul is telling. Each of you has a kin. This is the only verse which says what we should be doing on a Sunday. Okay? meeting when we have. Each of you has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or its interpretation. Paul is using those words, tongue, its interpretation as well in that. Everything must be done to build up the church, he says. Again, everything that is happening within the congregation when it meets, okay, on a Sunday should be with the aim of building other stuff. Not for my own self. There is no selfish element to be expressed on a Sunday. Not for my glory, not for myself, not for promoting my children, not for anything else. Okay, but for God alone. Okay, and to build others up. Paul laid down how this order will be reflected. Okay, 
and the remaining chapter is about tongues, about prophesying, and about women speaking, submission, silence, etc. Okay, but we are talking on tongues today, so we will look at only that aspect. Paul said how this practice of tongues should be regulated. He had listed in that list, he had already mentioned that it is one of the aspects that can be there. Okay, but he says how it should be regulated. In other words, if it is not according to this practice, then it is not the right way of accepting it, even if it is there. Okay. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 23. Only two or maximum three must be. Not the entire congregation. Not everyone who is gathered. Paul is very clear when he is talking about tongues. He says only two or maximum three. One at a time. One at a time. Not everyone together. Okay. Someone must interpret. Okay. The third condition. Someone must interpret. Fourth condition. If there is no one to interpret, then the speaker should remain. He should not even speak in tongues. Okay. So very clear way, orderly way. He says that it is for order in the church. God is a God of order. God is not a God of disorder. That is what he writes in this passage. Okay. In verse 33. Be eager to prophesy, he says. Don't forbid speaking in tongues. Okay. This is also an instruction which Paul has left in 1 Corinthians 14 39. But genuine tongues, if it is there, it will follow those four disciplines. Two or maximum three, only one at a time, only with interpretation, it will be in the control of the person. He will not speak if uh, there is no interpreter. Okay. A. B. Simpson, CNMA, okay, Christian and Missionary Alliance founder. He used this word, seek not, forbid not. You know, when the alliance churches broke, because there was some who went Pentecostal way, uh, some who went the other way, okay? Uh, so, finally, uh, the leadership of those churches brought together and studied the scriptures and they came up with this statement, seek not, forbid not, okay? As a practice for them. Tozer and other famous writers, also belong to the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Okay. So, we end with that. The scripture is very clear that we need to take warning. There are demonic practices. There are cults, satanic practices, religions which practice speaking in tongues. Within the church, whatever observed phenomena is there, you know, you must evaluate with the four principles that he gave. Okay. If you see tongues practiced with the restriction given by Paul, then it is an acceptable thing. If not, it is not something that is there. But when you read the book of Acts, you find that tongues was already losing its importance, losing its presence. And most of the New Testament, except for this passage in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14, do not talk about it anymore. Okay? We will end with that. Uh, request Linchen to show us in prayer.